The Irish Times ran a story yesterday from Jack Horgan Jones that there had been a survey uh, undertaken by the Department of Sport at the request of Jack Chambers, the Minister for Sport, into young people's attitudes towards participation. Uh, one of the big things that came up was school uniforms, uh, both for uh, boys and girls, men and women, and uh, but particularly young females found that school uniforms were a barrier to them continuing to do sport at school. And as we know, the drop-off rates for sport in secondary school is catastrophic at a, at a macro level in terms of the impact on health, socialisation, all sorts of reasons. If you believe in sport as any kind of power, uh, any force for good, then you realise that uh, kids dropping out of sport is really long-term bad and it's a force multiplier for all sorts of bad things uh, later on in life. Loneliness, depression, activity. You, you actually get better school results if people have um, undertaken any form of... Even walking will improve a child's ability uh, to remember stuff in the next hour. So uh, we, we feel like this is an important story and we should cover it. And I'm delighted to say Maeve de Burka is uh, joining us now, former Republic of Ireland Soccer International. Uh, Maeve, you've, you've done some work on this. You've been involved in this, I know, as, as a mentor as well. There's a separate research project that has been undertaken, which basically says largely the same stuff, I think. Yeah, exactly. Um, like I said, I, I work at Little and the LGFA in secondary schools, trying to decrease that drop off that you were talking about, you know, particularly within teenage girls. I think they're three times more likely than boys to give up sport by the age of 13, which is huge, really. Um, so that's what kind of the focus is on really and um, like you said there's so many other benefits health economic everything if we can try to encourage um, kids to stay in sport it, the uniform was the big thing that came up yesterday kind of the, the headline finding what could be done to fix that I think we need to move away from the rigid uh, uniform policy that we have it's quite unique in Ireland like you don't see it on the continent or in the US I think it needs to be become more uh, flexible you know just so that um both men and, and boys are sorry boys and girls are comfortable in what they're wearing you know because there's also obviously you're looking at the participation in sport itself but also when you look at physical activity you know how are kids going to school is it easy for them to go to school uh back in the day many years ago now I used to cycle to secondary school but you know, the first thing I noticed when I got the uniform, the skirt was down to my ankles. So that wasn't going to be uh, very safe or, you know, practical to, to cycle my bike with that. So I actually had to ask my mother to take up the skirt and to my knee so that I could cycle to school, you know, and those things really have to change. But I think we're moving in the right direction. Very slowly, like really very, you know, it's it's it, it seems like... You know, uh, I'm sure that um, you can change in schools now much easier than maybe you used to be able to. But at the same time, it's still not something that uh, is talked about at a massive level all the time. Uh, having a, an impact on cycling, on walking, on doing sport in school, it's kind of like these are separate things, you know. Oh, we need to we need to think about those parents who uh, don't have to then feel pressurised to buy the clothes that everybody... I'm like, what? Okay, that's a very strange counter argument to this all these other benefits that are over here yeah well, that's the thing i think the main thing is that the the uniform is comfortable you know um like you said yeah you could say to get rid of the uniform altogether but um it does open up another um topical debate i suppose at the moment given the cost of living crisis that we have you know there's a bill uh, before the doll at the moment uh, affordable school uniform policy that's um, trying to be introduced, you know, um, Wales, I think, are looking at the same thing in that to see that can um, can families buy uniforms, just generic uniforms and even iron on the crest rather than having to go and pay the 50 euro to one particular supplier. So I personally, I wouldn't be in favour of getting rid of uniforms completely, but I would be obviously in favour of, of making them um, more comfortable and obviously maybe like introduce some schools have PE uniforms, I know I did go into school, we had a PE uniform so that, you know, and make them more uh, even designed as well towards uh, females, you know, to, to make them more confident and confident and uh, more comfortable within their own um, the uniform that they are wearing on PE day or whatever day it is. What, what was your experience, generally speaking, Maeve, of, of PE when you were in school? Was it, was it encouraged? Um, it wasn't really. I went to a school where... Um, Firstly, I was only allowed to do one sport, um, wasn't even allowed to train with the other sport. Uh, thankfully, things have really moved on uh, from then in my old secondary school. 
but also even within um, the PE itself, only a select few of us were allowed to do it. Even a leave insert year it had to be the the more elite players, I suppose, which really is the players who lead, need it the least, I think, within a school setting because we were already getting enough physical activity outside of school with the many other sports we were doing. So uh, I did talk as well to a friend recently. She's a secondary school teacher and uh, the same thing there. Everyone in Leaving Cert isn't, isn't allowed to do PE, only those who are taking it on as a Leaving Cert subject. So anyone who uh, anyone else who isn't doing it, I believe in, you know, isn't partaking in any form of physical activity during the school day, um, which is massive, really, given the amount of time that teenagers and children spend in school. I'm glad to hear it's moved on from, from your old school because it certainly hasn't moved on in every school in Ireland to this day, especially in, in all girls' schools. Uh, like, do you, do you almost feel like there's a there's a disconnect between the obvious benefits of of exercise and PE and and studying? Because often the excuse given is, oh, no, they need to study; they don't have time for for PE. But clearly, exercise is in tandem with that. Yeah, I still remember, like I said, the the, the reason given to me that I I couldn't uh, even train with the two sports was that it would affect my academics. And, you know, I can't, I, I can't agree or disagree more strongly with that statement. You know, I know um, for a fact that um, sport helped me get through my academics. I, I remember even I used to um, kick a ball outside the wall. You know, I actually had neighbours that weren't too, too happy with me at late at night banging a ball against the wall in between my uh, study sessions, you know, just to try and um, release some of that stress, I suppose. And definitely helps me and I think it, it can be encouraged you know throughout particularly like I said those teenage years you know where physical activity um the the research is there that it does help and like I said even going out for a walk and that can stimulate the mind and um you know even now we know uh, all the mental health benefits as well that physical activity can bring um, not only to children and teenagers but to adults alike. Do you think people don't know about that? Is that why we're still uh, a little bit in the dark ages when it comes to integrating physical activity into study patterns and into the school day? Yeah, I think it's a cultural thing, really. I think um, it's how we've always done it. So then people are maybe not questioning it then. You know, I I know from my experiences abroad, like even um, I lived in Sweden for a bit and you know, the children there, they, they definitely do a lot more pee than we do here. They The, the young kids that come in they get changed, they shower after PE, you know, we, it's not done here. Um, so I think maybe people are aware of it, but just um, they're afraid to, I suppose, uh, question the, the the way it's done. And, you know, there's a lot of pressure on teachers from an academic side as well, you know, to be getting the results um, in the classroom. But like I said, um, you know, they, maybe they think that studying more will help that. Whereas, um, you know, we know that if you can try get a, a balanced approach, um, you'll definitely be more successful. Your your CV, your travelling CV is 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 strong, and as you say, Sweden, Norway, your time in America as well. So, like, when you've assessed those countries, like, how how do we compare? Are, are we are we struggling noticeably compared to other countries when it comes to PE and and, and encouraging uh, physical education for young people? Yeah, I think so. Like when you think about it, that only um, an average, I think, an hour is given to PE you know, in schools, um, and I know one school I was talking to recently, they have a uh, double class, so they have 80 minutes, but that includes, uh, you know, getting changed before and after and, you know, setting up everything. So it's really, we're really, really limited in the time that we are given um, to PE. And I think, you know, Ireland has one of the highest uh, childhood obesity rates, unfortunately, in Europe, like one in every four school going children in Ireland are either overweight or obese and like that's just you know that statistic 25 percent is it's it's scary really to think because you know obviously the rate of them then bringing that obesity into to adulthood is is very high and that that in itself can lead to so many um health uh, challenges so yeah I think I think the other countries I've I've experienced anyway they're definitely ahead of Ireland um in terms of the emphasis that they place on physical activities uh, within a school setting. Maybe as a matter of interest why do you think we should stick with uniforms? I think um I suppose 
there's a lot of families maybe who are financially challenged and uh, maybe even from disadvantaged areas, it, it nearly levels the playing field slightly, um, you know, in that the children don't have to be wearing the latest gear or, the, you know, the pressure isn't there on families to, to have to keep providing um, for children, at least in a, at least in that, that school setting. I know, obviously, they'd be wearing the clothes outside of school, but I think it does take a lot of financial pressure off the families, particularly if that affordable school uniform bill comes through the doll as well. Yeah, I just... I, I always like you make the point they're, they're wearing other clothes outside of school anyway and like it's cheap to buy clothes now in a way that it maybe wasn't like when we were kids you got like uh, you know one pair of jeans and they were going to last you for the year now now you can get like good quality well made stuff in a load of different shops that probably weren't selling it fast fashion obviously is not great for the planet but it does mean that it's actually probably cheaper in the long run to buy clothes for families than it would have been up to any point. It feels to me it's a little bit like um, it's a slight red herring when the benefits are that actually you'd be, have people coming into clothes, coming into school who would feel like they can bring a change of clothes with them and it doesn't really matter what they're wearing in class and they're not going to get in trouble for it. Yeah, I, I do understand that, that point as well, I suppose. But then, um, you know, even I suppose every teenager doesn't always want to be dressed in clothes from pennies or duns either. You know, they might want the latest Liverpool or United shirt for 80 euro go as well. And um, I suppose there's that, that side of it too. But I, I yeah, I understand, um, you know, they want to be comfortable in school. But I think if you make the, um, the PE uniform or the P track suit, if, if you do make that... Um, something that, that the majority of children will be comfortable wearing, then that could kind of, I suppose, resolve that, that side of it. Are, are we getting better at this, May, from what you've seen? Are we making progress? I think we're making slow progress. Uh, I don't think we're anywhere near where we need to be at the moment. Um, you know, I do think that the, the funding needs to go into it as well as, um, you know, the, the emphasis needs to be there, but also see if we can try to just increase physical activities in, in other ways, even even um, outside of the school setting too and try to, you know, prevent these kind of, um, I suppose, the, the dramatic health um, and economic um, disadvantages that we get from being inactive. You know, um, like I said, there was a study released um, last year saying that, you know, physical activity, um, if, if the inactivity, I suppose, causes up to 100,000 cases of disease every year in Ireland. And, you know, that then in turn leads to financial um implications as well so I think it's just such a broader um, issue as well you know that needs needs to be looked at even in terms of I suppose just as a society we need to move on because even now you can see the office settings you know we're no longer seeing the, the suits and the ties and the shirts being be worn every day so I think you know why can't we move on from a uniform in schools perspective as well. Yeah I think um, definitely broadly in, in agreement with that. Um, Kevin Cavaz has been in touch to say that the, he was talking about the USA, uh, they agreed equal pay, which includes World Cup bonuses for the men's and women's teams. So the women's team will get half the men's bonus and then when the women win the World Cup, the men will get half of that bonus. And, you know, on, on balance, this is their move towards um, equality. We're seeing, he says, that, that Canada are likely to do the same as well and this will all be ongoing, so into the future. Uh, is this something we should look at in Ireland where, I mean... You know, obviously the women might be giving up more bonuses in terms of qualification for tournaments, but certainly like equal match fees, and then from that point forward. So, if and when the men qualify for a World Cup and the four hundred forty million prize pot is being divided, that the women should get their cut of that too. Yeah, I mean, in an ideal situation, I think that's that's what um, hopefully will happen. Um, whether it'll happen, you know, in the next couple of years, um, or I'm not sure, but. You know, we have made huge progress, like you said, with the equal pay and the the match fees at the moment. Um, it really is is great strides um, in the right direction. The the US, the women's national team over there, have always been the trendsetters, I suppose, and they're the you know they're the number one in the world, and they're they really are. They always kind of set the ball in motion for the rest of the world to follow. So, um, I think it's huge what's been done there, and you know, to even yeah see the the men's qualification out into the out of the group stage benefiting the women it's it's massive so hopefully yes um, that, that should happen hopefully in the years to come in Ireland it would be great to see it It's funny Maeve when you talk about the, the women qualifying for the World Cup next year like I almost feel like there would be no choice schools will have to allow young girls to push and do more exercise in PE because uh, that argument will be, will be there the more we see female role models in Irish sport 
the more that push is going to just become natural. And I think, I guess Vera Powell's team have, have really uh, blazed that trail in, in many ways. Yeah, for sure. I mean, when it becomes more mainstream, like you said, and it's it's visible in the media more, then it just becomes part of our culture. I think before this, it was always kind of trying to break down barriers and, you know, even um, teachers within a school setting, they may not have been, you know, even exposed that much um, to women's sport. I know even in my primary school that the sports that were all led by the male teachers. We only had two male teachers within the whole school, but they, they were always the coaches of our sports teams and, and that. So even now, I think, you know, we will see more female teachers, more female coaches, role models and all that. And they will be bringing along um, the girls and, and teenage um, girls with them in that regard too. So, yeah, I think all the... the I think the qualification for the World Cup, that lonely kind of start the ball rolling, it's only the start of it really. I think it's going to spiral um, to make a, a real big uh, movement towards higher participation levels with uh, teenage girls. Maybe you were in Qatar recently, I believe? I was, yeah, just briefly. Uh, yeah, a little layover there. So it was very interesting to see, um, you know, how, how the World Cup has been um, run over there. But yeah, just, just a brief stop over there. Did you get out and about? I didn't. Um, unfortunately, the Qatar rules state that you can't leave the airport uh, unless you have a World Cup ticket, which I didn't have. I didn't have um, my my time over there. wasn't going to take in a World Cup match, unfortunately. But I did want to. The hope was that I would get out to see the atmosphere. But um, I did get to taste it within the airport setting. So it was definitely interesting to see um, all the different blend of cultures all uh, passing through the airport. All right. So you're welcome, but not really to step outside the airport. <laughs> it's an, yeah. in- an interesting dynamic. Yeah, I can't understand it from an economic perspective why you don't want um, people coming in, um, you know, to potentially spend money within your country. But and uh, it's only the rules are only in place during the duration of the World Cup. Uh, you know, during any other time, you're free to leave the airport. So, um, yeah, it was an unusual one, to be honest, one I, I couldn't really understand. But um, I can't understand, you know, a lot about that country. So, no, it, I think it's a, a fair summation. Maeve, great stuff. Thanks a million for joining us this morning. Cheers. Thanks a million, guys. Talk to you soon. Maeve de Burke there, uh, former Republic of Ireland international.